Podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, and thank you for joining today's PCPCC webinar, Artificial Intelligence and Primary Care. During the webinar, we will hear from experts about artificial intelligence, you know, including a really broad perspective and implica implications for primary care. I'm Julie Schills. I'm a senior director in the Commercial Health Innovations at Mathematica. In the context of facilitating today, however, I am a executive liaison um, to the board for PCPCC. I have this role along with Rob Durbin from Merck. We so appreciate that you joined us today, but before we get started, a few housekeeping items. Um, the presentation and recording will be available, so no worries. You don't have to madly write everything down. And everything will be available for you after uh, the presentation and posted on the PCPCC website. Please give it a, you know, a day or so before that happens, but it will be posted. Um, I'd like to take a moment to share a preview of an upcoming webinar planned for next month. On June 21st, from 1 to 2 Eastern Time, PCPCC will hold a webinar on action steps to integrate behavioral health into primary care practice. It's featuring uh, two doctors from my own home state of Colorado, Larry Green and Stephanie Gold um, from the University of Colorado School of Medicine. Um, we'll also have a panel. Um, of thought leaders to really lead the discussion. It should be quite good, so please check that out. The PCPCC website will be um, have registration information soon. Um, you know, for we had 700 registrants today for the webinar, and for those of you who are not members, I'd like to take an opportunity to con have you consider doing so um, and becoming an ex executive member of PCPCC. Please feel free to reach out to any of the um, staff members at PCPCC if you're really interested in supporting the movement for team-based uh, primary care. I've had the pleasure of being associated with PCPCC since the organization started, um, having worked with several organizations who have been executive members, and we've certainly um, found so much value in being an executive member. Um, being an active participant at the table with a lot of other stakeholders working to support primary care, joining in the collective voice um, really so that we can achieve the shared principles of primary care, and thinking and helping support PCPCC and directly and effectively responding to healthcare environment. Um, as an executive member, you will help guide PCPCC's future direction. Um, through participation in webinars such as this one, policy calls, and uh, work groups. So as you can see, there's something for everyone, um, so please consider that. And finally, be sure to save the date for PCPCC's annual conference to be held in the fall um, in Washington, D.C. on November 4th and 5th. So with that, I'm going to move on to starting our presentation and introduce our panelists. Um, first of all, we have Dr. Anil Jain, um, he's the VP and Chief Medical Officer at Watson Health with IBM. He was a co-founder, Senior VP and Chief Medical Officer of Explorus, um, formed through and developed by him while he was at Cleveland Clinic. Um, Explorus was acquired by IBM and is now a really integral component of the newly formed Watson Health Business Unit. And in 2007, he was appointed to Congress by Congress to the Federal Health IT Advisory Committee um, established by the 21st Century Cures Act. We also have Dr. Steve Waldron, who is Vice President, Chief Medical Informatics Officer at the American Academy of Family Physicians. Steve is nationally recognized as an expert in health information technology, and prior to joining AFP, though I've known him for many years there, um, Steve was a na at the National Library of Medicine's Medical Informatics 
um, postdoctoral fellow at the University of Missouri Columbia. Um, and there he earned his master's degree in medical informatics. Last but not least, we have Lisa Berry, um, Health IT and Interoperability Lead at the CMS Innovation Center. Lisa's background combines health policy, health IT, and more than a decade of technology-focused marketing and communication strategy. And at CMS, Lisa wrote and implemented a really critical part of the health IT policies for the Comprehensive Primary Care Plus model. So with that, I'll move us um, into our presentation. We'll let everybody know we've, um, how we have time for question and answer after everyone's presentation. So keep those questions coming into the chat box. With, but with that, I will turn it over to Anil. Great. Thank you, Julie. So what I'll do in the next few minutes is just sort of go over um, a little bit about how we're thinking about AI uh, and the challenges and opportunities, especially when it comes to primary care. And what we'll think about, uh, I want to make sure the slides advance, they did, that we, we all are on the same page about some of the challenges that we're, we're expecting. I think this group in particular, we don't need to explain that we're, we're sort of in a very uh, interesting time uh, where medical information is, is growing at exponential rates. And more often than not, much of the value that is sitting in our uh, patient encounters is sitting in unstructured notes rather than in discrete elements of an e electronic health record. We also know that for the most part, there's going to be a significant shortage, especially in primary care. Uh, and despite the fact that we have all this technology that we're using, about a third of what we do uh, is probably unnecessary uh, or, or is leading to unnecessary cost. Uh, and that only 50% of our patients are receiving the best uh, quality uh, metrics um, achievable. So when we start thinking about these challenges, um, you know, AI is certainly something that comes to, to mind. But before we go any further, I want to tell you a little bit um, about my journey from primary care uh, to big data to trusted AI. As Julie mentioned in my intro, um, I was a clinician at the Cleveland Clinic um, some time ago, and I'm still there part time. But we were dealing with a uh, sort of a deluge of data, um, having all this electronic health record data and trying to understand how we can use that for quality. Uh, that led to the formation of Explorus, which was a big data analytics company, where we were bringing that data out and, and simply trying to make it easier to measure and easier to find uh, patterns that we could uh, interact with. But as this information grew, uh, it became abundantly clear that just simply working with data uh, doesn't necessarily mean that you're actually working with insights and information. IBM, uh, formed um, Watson Health as sort of a response to the fact that we we needed a way to really uh, take advantage of all the, the, the capabilities that high performance computing along with the ed, uh, the advances that they made using Watson. You, you'll remember Watson famously beating Jennings and Jeopardy some time ago. But one of the first areas um, that they decided to apply this capability was on was healthcare. And so Watson Health was formed with the acquisition of Explorus and Phytel in 2015. Uh, and then if you fast forward to where we are today, we've got quite a bit of experience now dealing with not just using AI in different uh, areas of healthcare delivery and operations, but also learned a few lessons along the way that I'm happy to share. And there's a bunch of books that have talked about our journey um, and the acquisition of Explorus and all that. And um, you can get those books and read the sort of the chapters that describe it, uh, if you like. But the bottom line is, is that uh, this has been a, a an interesting journey, uh, to say the least. And in the process, what we are sort of looking at is that we are now in a cognitive computing era. Uh, back when I was in biomedical engineering school, we were often programming computers to tell the systems what to do when different folks press this button or ask for this, then we would program what the responses ought to be. But in a cognitive computing era or in an AI era, these systems are taught by recognizing patterns after being trained with large amounts of data, which explains why uh, IBM and, and others are interested in large data sets. It's important to, 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 to start training these systems and not necessarily program them because in certain uh, situations, it's not possible to give every single possible scenario and expect this, the computer to be able to generate a valid uh, answer. So that in a AI era or in a cognitive computing era, uh, 
the training data sets and understanding what it is that we're trying to uh, achieve from the inputs uh, is critical. Now, a lot of people often ask me, you know, uh, what is AI? How is it different than some of the other buzzwords that we might be hearing about, like machine learning or deep learning uh, or big data? And simply put, uh, for us, uh, AI uh, is augmented intelligence in many ways, and it encompasses what we typically think about as machine learning uh, or deep learning neural networks, for example, that, that have hidden layers of nodes. Um, and it intersects with big data, but AI, uh, in my opinion, is what makes big data usable uh, for a vast majority of use cases. Otherwise, it's just too difficult for us with our human brains to get a handle on. And we as humans are, are certainly different than AI. So anytime anyone says, well, AI, isn't that going to replace me as a clinician? Or isn't that going to make what I do as a clinician less meaningful? Um, I remind them that, that AI systems are not, are not going to be able to replace what we do really, really well. Uh, most of us, except some of my teenagers, um, have great common sense. We deal with moral dilemmas and we have imagination, we dream, and we can think in abstract terms in ways that even the most sophisticated AI systems have challenges with. But AI systems are very good at other things. I know when I was post-call that I was making less better decisions than I was when I was fresh and alert. And AI systems don't tire out. They recognize patterns where where we might uh, be challenged. Um, we sometimes see that AI systems are better at eliminating bias, but of course they also can have their own inher inherent biases that we'll talk about. Uh, but most importantly, I think the, the, the AI that we think about should be thought, thought of as man plus machine, not man versus machine. Now, I'm gonna go through a few different uh, use cases um, in what we think about as experiences that we've had um, within this space and, and then talk a little bit more in depth um, about cer certain areas and then uh, uh, and and then we'll we'll touch upon a few areas where we've learned quite a bit in the in the four years that we've been uh, at uh, trying to introduce AI um, in in some areas very very well and other areas with some challenges uh, I'm not going to list through all these opportunities and challenges you have the handout but I think it's pretty clear that most of us who practice medicine uh, are dealing with significant amounts of information that are scattered all over the place. Uh, and when you're trying to deal with value-based care, some of that information may be, may be with us in our primary care uh, record, but some of it may be in other um, locations like with the payer. And AI has an, op there's an opportunity of bringing all that information together. There's also the opportunity to be thinking about increasing the efficiency of making diagnoses or suggesting various treatment patterns um, that may be difficult um, because we're not always gonna be on top of every latest and greatest journal article and assimilate all the, the evidence and the eminence that's required. And then there, are, of course, there are mundane activities um, that we could help, uh, we can use AI to help some of the administrative tasks, tasks that I'll talk about in a second. But for the most part, the biggest opportunity of AI in primary care is it allows each member of our care team to operate at the top of their license, um, as opposed to some of the challenges that we often see. Um, and we don't have to go very far to see some of those challenges around physician burnout, and I'll speak to that in a second. But there are challenges with AI. Um, as I said earlier, AI requires large amounts of training data sets, and we don't have reliable access to data in every case. Um, we, we know that when you do use training data sets, that there are inherent biases that might arise or security concerns or privacy concerns. And even when you do have access, sometimes the, the interoperability challenges make it, make it a challenge. When I say CP in my practice, I mean chest pain. But if a neurologist says CP, they often will mean cerebral palsy. So that lack of interoperability and the lack of, of having those standards um, address those concerns could, could be a challenge. And of course, some of the other challenges have to do with the black boxing of AI solutions. Most clinicians are gonna be hard pressed to use things that they don't understand, or at least don't have evidence behind them. And we need to make sure we get away from the, AI, the black boxing of AI. And of course, there's the regulatory concerns and, and ethical concerns of AI that we'll get into. Now, we know that electronic health records have, have 
have been, have had a very interesting uh, uh, sort of uh, road to adoption. Um, years and years, and we we see uh, some challenges with with them. And I'm not going to go through all this. There's a, a really good article that you might want to read about some of the challenges. But with this adoption um, has come a challenge. Uh, this is an example of the size of ambulatory progress notes. Many of us in primary care write notes, but we write those, those notes for various reasons. Um, sometimes to comply with regulatory mandates, practicing defensive medicine. Sometimes it's simply our residents and students copying and pasting one note to the next. And, and often we get very large notes and it's, it's almost impossible to find the most important information that's in them. And you can see that in the US our notes are far, far longer than our international colleagues. And so we need to figure out how we can get back to the essence of the notes and AI has, a, has an answer for that. Other specialists are already taking advantage of this. Radiologists already use AI and imaging uh, capabilities to detect uh, abnormalities. I'm not gonna go through all of this and there's plenty of, of stuff that you can, you can look into it. Again, it'll be in the handout. But we know just yesterday or the day before, uh, the FDA approved the use of AI to look for pneumothorax on chest x-rays. Um, so this is something that imaging folks, radiologists and others are already taking advantage of. The same thing in the dermatology space. Uh, imagine a primary care doc being able to take a picture of a rash and very quickly deciding uh, or being, being told what the, the score is of whether this is a melanoma or not, and then making the appropriate referral uh, often saving uh, anxiety and time uh, and perhaps even cost uh, for a, a busy practice and for a patient. We also know that um, coupled with, with connected health and devices that um, may go along the side of a, a patient, for example, diabetes, that we can enhance the way that primary care doctors might manage diabetics. So instead of making decisions based on a glucose diary, 15 minutes uh, every three months uh, sitting in their office, they can make uh, decisions with a connected device, with a smart app powered by AI, helping manage that particular patient's uh, insulin dosing and sugar with the provider, not instead of the provider, but with the provider. Now, some of that requires us to be, oops, some of that requires us to be thinking about, well, how do we actually use AI to get more information out of the electronic health record, summarize it so that the clinicians aren't forging around that medical record, but simply having that information being presented to them uh, in, so that they don't have to click on multiple uh, tabs. This is work that we're doing with a health system out on the East Coast uh, and, and really helping uh, understand and, and summarize the medical information in the e EMR. And at the same time, looking through scores of individuals that might have similar conditions, creating a precision cohort, and helping them understand what the impact of different decisions might be so that, that the primary care physician working with their patient can make the most appropriate decision uh, for their patient. Now, folks have, have thought about all these different aspects of, of how AM, AI might fit into a, a practice, trying to avoid the black boxing um, approach, and have come up with some policy positions. Certainly, um, IBM has. Uh, and so as the AMA, they've talked about augmented intelligence in healthcare and would refer you to their, their policy paper um, uh, that you can find on their website. And we at IBM have also been thinking about some of the other aspects of AI, including trust and explainability and fairness and ethics. We formed academic partnerships with MIT, for example, Vanderbilt, uh, as well as uh, Brigham, uh, Brigham Women's to really understand how do we actually get this out of the lab and how do we start thinking about this as a way for how computers and humans interact with each other and thinking about how uh, we, we make this a little bit easier for the average clinician and for the more advanced clinicians to be able to bring it into their practice and make it part of their, their, their practice instead of uh, uh, having replaced their decision making, make it a augmented uh, tool that could help them. We've done the same thing around bias. One of the biggest things that we worry about is that when you have training data sets is that we don't introduce bias. Um, and, and so we have built open source tools that can help identify where bias might be creeping in and, and triggering uh, alerts so that those folks who are using these tools can um, respond appropriately. So what I'll do is I'll pause here. I know we'll have time for questions, but there is a significant amount of promise uh, for 
AI in primary care. We need to learn from other specialty areas and we need to learn from other industries on how to do it well in healthcare. Healthcare is not the same as other industries, but there are enough similarities that should give us um, great promise. And I'll turn it back over to Julie. Thank you, Anil, and thank you for your presentation and really starting us off. I want to remind everybody to feel free to, um, to type in questions in the chat box. Uh, Chris from PCPCC and I will be monitoring that. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Steve. Thanks, Julie, and thanks, Anil. Um, so what I wanted to do is kind of focus a little bit kind of more on kind of the potential impact of, of, of AI um, and then finish up with what some of the stuff that the, the AAFP is trying to do in this space um, and, and why we're uh, moving into activities around AI. Um, this is one of the key things that I think um, primary care folks have to realize when it comes to the notion of uh, artificial intelligence machine learning. The red shows this performance curve of, of AI um, and the thing is that it is able to grow and learn at exponential rates. Um, so maybe in 2016, you heard of uh, Google's um, AI model that was looking at diabetic retinopathy with retinal scans. Um, and in 2016, it was about as good as an average ophthalmologist of determining, you know, are there uh, diabetic changes or not. Um, fast forward just one year, it was as good as a retinal subspecialist in doing that as well. So things that may seem to be kind of toy um, models right now are very quickly going to become models that are, are well steeped to be able to have an impact in, in primary care. Um, the challenge here is that the human formants here in the green is fairly linear. It takes us a while to learn and to improve, but we, we, we can do that, but we do that in a linear fashion. The great news, as Anil kind of pointed to, is the fact that augmented intelligence are taking the human and the AI together um, can significantly outperform either the AI alone or the human alone. The challenge here, as you see the gray um, dollar signs there, is that um, having an AI model uh, calculate something, each instance of that is very, very cheap, where when you add the human to the model, it gets to be very expensive. Um, and there's a real concern that a large chunk of what we do as physicians may be able to be replaced. Um, if you haven't um, uh, saw uh, the new COSLA's um, um, op ed piece around the 20% doctor included, He's assuming that over a period of maybe 20, 25 years, that 80% um, of what we do as physicians may be able to be replaced with, with AI. And I think when you think about that, though, um, think about all the pressures that Anil started to allude to with the um, burnout, the cost effectiveness, the medical errors that we have, the volume of new evidence, just the volume of health data. Um, it's going to need these AI tools to help us, but I think there's a real opportunity. Back in uh, several years ago, Andy Grove, when he was uh, chairman of Intel, talked about a, a shift left of taking from high acuity places like an ICU and be able to move that care to lower acuity of the hospital to the ambulatory clinic and potentially um, out to the home and each time being less costly. I think there's an opportunity for a new left shift as it comes to, to the domain of AI of taking things that we typically had been doing um, in the area of subspecialists, be able to move that to primary care. And likely, likely things that we were doing in primary care could be moved to less acuity um, um, individuals as well. And I think when you think about AI, you think about you know replacing and, and those type of things, don't think of these um, individuals as um, this monolithic thing or you know, a primary care doc is this one thing, but rather it's a collection of tasks and skills and competencies. And there are certain things that AI is going to be able to assume. There are going to be certain things that um, having the human augmented by AI will allow things to be done uh, much better. And there are new tasks that will be able to be placed onto um, um, the PCP with the use of, of AI. So if you think about these tasks, those things that are um, less complex, that have uh, better data, that have better quality of data and that are lower risk are more likely to be things that will be moved into the AI space um, as opposed to it being mainly a, a human only task um, in, in the near term. So as we look at that, the other thing that's happening is that there's a lot of investment. There's, there's billions of dollars being invested in healthcare AI, and it's continuing to, to grow. And if you look at 2019, it's going to follow the same type of curve. curve. 
And when they're looking at these things, they're, they're looking at funding these in multiple different areas. So this gives, gives you a sense of kind of Silicon Valley, what are they trying to focus in on as it relates to AI and try to solve some problems. And there's anything from research and drug development uh, to patient adherence to uh, clinical and non-clinical workflows and trying to improve those type of things. But as we think about it from a primary care perspective, um, for us at the AASP and I think for many primary care docs, the main problem is that it's this burnout issue, that the current EHRs are just not up to speed relative to usability and effectiveness for us in regards to documentation and things like that. And a lot of our time is being spent on clerical burden. So what's driving things is that primary care physicians are not being able to primarily care for patients and to focus on the triple aim, they're focused on working in the EHR. Uh, and this is a, a graphic that was uh, produced that's showing that no matter where you're at in regards to the day or weekend, night or day, um, docs are out there documenting. Um, so this is one area that we're really trying to focus on because it's eroding the, uh, the professional satisfaction as well as not helping us achieve the triple aim. So as we thought about AI, we see these as three big problems that we have to, to deal with in, in family medicine and in essence primary care as well. First is the clerical burden that's burning out the physicians that we talked about. We also have the value-based payment that's coming around and as we take more financial risk, it has the potential to burn down practices. And then with the, the notion of the AI and ML, it has the potential to fundamentally change what it means to be a family physician or a primary care physician. And what we're thinking at the AAFP is that we're able to drive innovations focused on the needs of our primary care docs that will be able to address these particular uh, burdens moving forward. Sorry, the tool keeps jumping off of my um, power, so it's hard to advance the slides. Um, so where could AI help primary care? Well, I see these as the big buckets that we can look at um, trying to leverage AI to, to make primary care better. Um, first and foremost, the administrative burden. Um, we're focused on that a lot because that allows us to create some slack in the, in the system, allowing our docs to think about adopting and transforming and doing other things. Um, the next is cognitive burden, so being able to take some of the burden off. So, um, and Anil talked about the x-rays. Um, if you're able to say, you know, this is a normal x-ray or here's the potential areas that you need to focus in on, um, a doc to be able to do that. What if you're able to do that now with the chart and say, these are areas inside the chart that you need to look at. Did you see this particular abnormal lab? Uh, or by the way, this group of 600 reports are all normal and the labs are normal um, and you don't have to really focus your efforts on that. There's also this opportunity to expand our capacity and capabilities. Uh, and then there's really cool things around being able to predict disease and predict outcomes um, that we can leverage AI to do. So what if instead of you were documenting your note um, in the EHR, um, that you're able to um, walk up and have a, a mobile device and be able to say, hey, um, hey computer, tell me about my next patient. And the computer would be able to know that this patient was a diabetic and for their annual exam. So they would say 45 year old uh, male with diabetes, hemoglobin A1C, well, I was taken uh, four months ago. It was 9.2. I don't see a, um, a history of a ophthalmologic exam. Last foot exam was done by you uh, three months ago, it was normal. Um, blood sugars at home have been doing well, um, way to stable. So then you could be able to go in and have a conversation with the patient and you could walk in the exam room and say, hey computer, you know, take, listen, listen and uh, take notes of what we're talking about today. We do a conversation, we find out that, you know what, we still want to change the meds around a little bit. So we're going to discontinue med A, uh, we're going to increase med B and we're going to add med C to the list. And by the way, you really need to have that uh, ophthalmology exam done. So we're going to order that to be referred out. Um, and then we want to see you back here in, in, in two months, and we want to do annual or excuse me, weekly check-ins with you with our nurse educator about uh, diet and, and exercise. At the end of that, exam, that conversation, there's a note saying everything you want to do. There's orders to uh, adjust the medications. There's the referral to ophthalmology for the exam. There's an um, appointment scheduled for um, the two months we did, and there's a weekly schedule already set up. And you look at it and say, yeah, that looks good. Um, I want to sign that note. And then you leave the room and say, hey, computer, what's my next patient? 
that type of technology with AI exists today. Uh, we just need to be able to train it to be able to do that well. So we are trying to do that here at the AAFP. We are not going to accept the status quo that the current technology is not helping us take care of our patients. Um, and we'll continue our advocacy efforts, but we're adding a new set of activities to really see our role to how do we improve and promote innovations that establish the best practices that our membership needs. And we're doing that through two activities, um, and one of them is around the challenges, which I'll uh, let Lisa uh, talk all about because we're excited to be able to partner with CMMI on that project. Uh, but the other one that we're doing is creating an innovation lab where we take these solutions, and a lot of them are going to be AI-based, um, to drop them into practices and make sure they're effective and that they're adoptable. Because um, it really takes the human component as well as the AI component to be able to work these things and, and get the solutions that we want. And we're going to focus those around the optimization of, of primary care and family medicine. And our first one that we're looking at that we're hopeful to be able to start in the next month or so is a computer pro, uh, AI a clinical assistant that helps us do the thing that we just talked about um, in the what if scenario that it actually be able to do a smart dictation, be able to understand orders, create the orders, uh, and get us away from typing and, and clicking and, and those type of things, but rather starting to have a conversation with the computer to document what we want to get accomplished. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to um, Lisa to talk more about kind of what we're doing with that space, but this is our trajectory with those special projects that we want to be able to do. So thank you. Okay, I can just pick it up from there. This is Lisa Berry. Um, Julie, I'm just going to jump in. Um, so, um, as, as Stephen said, uh, at the Innovation Center, we are looking to support the work that's happening in the space. And um, together with our partners at AFP and a few others, we recently launched the CMS Artificial Intelligence Health Outcomes Challenge. And the genesis of this, and you may have um, you know, heard or another webinar on this or seen other information, is that at the Innovation Center in our models, which are designed to improve the quality of care, reduce the cost of care uh, in Medicare, Medicaid, and CHIP, um, we are uh, currently providing, at minimum in CPC Plus, the Comprehensive Primary Care Plus program, uh, we uh, provide a retrospective uh, data feedback tool to assist those providers in being successful in their models. And we were thinking about how we could make those tools potentially also predictive or prospective and add tools such as predictive analytics or other machine learning or artificial intelligence into that data feedback to help them um, actually keep people healthy, keep people out of the hospital. And so we came up with this idea along with our partners and uh, launched it uh, in uh, March. And we are currently in what we call the launch stage where the public can actually apply to be part of the challenge. We'll talk about that really briefly, and I want to say there's lots of slides here. I'm not going to go through all of them, but they're all available on our website, which is ai.cms.gov. Pretty easy to remember. So you'll get that um, through uh, the slides here in this webinar, but you can also just go to ai.cms.gov if I'm going too fast for you, or if you want to see more information or learn how you can actually apply if you don't already know. So let's see if I can make these slides go forward. Disclaimer, please look at the full public notice. All the rules and regulations and requirements are available on uh, ai.cms.gov or go.cms.gov slash AI. Um, okay, I'm not going to do all these slides as I just mentioned. Um, so really high level, again, this is a $1.65 million um, innovation challenge, a prize competition designed to um, encourage the development of AI models that predict health outcomes, which we've defined as um, as unplanned hospital admissions and unplanned skilled nursing facility admissions and other adverse events um, that will be used to support the, um, the innovation center models that we currently test um, under the um, Section 1115A uh, authority. Um, so we talked about this briefly, but um, we're concerned about um, people, providers being successful in innovation center models around um, high rates of unplanned admissions, adverse events, they're costly, um, they are very poor quality care, um, plenty of adverse outcomes from those unplanned admissions. And then um, our goals for the challenge are specifically to uh, have the participants use AI and deep learning methodologies to predict these unplanned hospital and SNF admissions. 
Um, and also, really more importantly, almost more importantly, is to actually develop innovative strategies and methodologies to explain those AI-derived predictions, derived predictions to frontline clinicians and patients. This is where we come to the primary care piece. There are plenty of organizations out there who are already building um, predictive models um, based on healthcare data. What we think is missing and what our partners thought was missing with us is um, the delivery layer. So we think it's really important that not only are predictive models created that can be used in, in primary care and other care settings, but also we want to make sure that people can understand what is this data? What are these predictions? How can I actually incorporate them into primary care? Um, and how can I make sure that I understand and trust and, and believe uh, what, uh, what, is, what is being presented to me? So again, two major goals in the competition, a predictive model and also a uh, delivery layer that helps drive trust and transparency. And so here's what we're looking for, accurate and, accurate and actionable and explainable and trustworthy solutions that really help build um, that transparency and trust with clinicians and patients. So um, just really quickly, and I'm actually going to stop after this so we can go to some questions and some discussion. Um, we are, there are three major stages of the competition, and we're in the launch stage. That actually ends on June 18th, and we have asked that, um, you know, people from the public, whether they are clinicians, uh, researchers, technologists, um, patients, anyone related, um, we're asking folks to um, apply on our website. And we're also asking folks to join and create really diverse teams that include um, groupings of all of the above. Uh, we don't think any one group, you know, it's not going to be solved by just, uh, just physicians or just technologists, but really we think that the best teams will include um, people from different walks of life with different types of experience. So launch stage, um, then there's stage one where we are going to refine and pick um, 20 to 25 uh, teams from the launch stage. Um, stage two will refine further. And finally, um, the grand prize we expect to award um, sometime early next year. Currently, we're expecting around April 2020, and the grand prize is $1 million, and the runner-up prize is $250,000. So it's a pretty big prize. We're very excited about it. We think it's really relevant to primary care based on all the work we do at the Innovation Center and the models and working with our partners at AFP. Um, so um, I'm going to stop there and actually hopefully let us get into some discussion. So I'll pass it back over to Julie. Thanks so much, Lisa. Um, I had the, I, I'm going to take the prerogative of the facilitator and start with the first question. I know Chris is monitoring the chat. Um, we're having a little bit of, I'm having some technical difficulty not being able to see those questions, so we may pass it off uh, between each other. But the first question I have, and it, it actually comes um, I was at the CPC Plus national meeting last week in Baltimore, and Adam Bowler asked a question of a group of um, panelists, who, and the discussion was about AI, and the question was, does AI dehumanize care? I'd like to ask that of all of you, and maybe we'll just go in the same, uh, in the same uh, order that all of you presented. So Anil, I'm wondering if you could take that first and then hear from Steve and Lisa. Yeah, absolutely. It's a it's a great question, Julie. Um, you know, I think the biggest threat to de dehumanizing care uh, in in medicine, especially among primary care doctors, is the challenge of, of burnout. Is the fact that we're inundated by data uh, and not information, but data, and that we have all these different regulatory burdens and and uh, programs that we have to comply with, and we we seem to sort of be uh, further away from what we went into medicine to do. Um, so I, I think AI actually has the ability to bring us back to that by taking some of those very low level mundane activities that we're actually not very good at and, and allowing the computer systems that are AI based to do some of that for us so that we could actually have that conversation with the patient, really understand what drives the patient's motivation and, and bring some of the joy back to medicine. Now, uh, is it is it possible that AI could could dehumanize medicine uh, and care? Absolutely, but not if we're a part of it. Not if the clinical community works together with with those who are building these solutions and says that we are really interested in an augmented intelligence type of environment rather than trying to replace us as clinicians. Um, but I, I I think it's the answer to bring some of the focus back to what we're what we've been trained to do uh, and and take away some of these 
mundane activities. And this, this is Steve, I, I, I completely agree. I mean, AI in itself is just a tool um, and it can be used for good or it can be used for evil. Um, so I think, again, having to be involved in the process, making sure that it's being done for good. The other thing I would add from a technical aspect, there are some really cool things in addition to some, you know, removing a lot of the admin burden that you have to do. But um, there's a thing called affective computing, um, which is allowing uh, computers to understand human affect and start to mimic that. So being able to understand that the user is confused or um, or is, um, you know, bored, being able to understand that and change the interface and the interaction because of that, I think ha is able to be able to humanize the kind of experience a little bit more. But I think the biggest thing is what Neil said is that you just get rid of all the stuff that we don't need to, to be able to focus on and allow us to go back and really primarily care for patients. And I think that's the thing that AI has the potential to do. Yeah, I mean, I, I would definitely agree. Um, I, I would, I would argue that uh, the current state of care dehumanizes care, and um, for for both, you know, physicians and providers, and and patients, right? I, I think some of that can be addressed by dealing with the back office stuff, the administrative tasks that we just discussed. You know, you'll note, of course, that our AI challenge is a little bit flashier. We're on the prediction side of. Uh, of population health and supporting care delivery. And I think that's gonna be really interesting in terms of dipping our toes in the water and figuring out how we can um, deliver those recommendations that essentially augmented intelligence to assist um, frontline clinicians. But I, I do think that you know the current state of play has done a pretty good job dehumanizing uh, care as it is. <laughs> You know, um, bringing what all of you said together, you're reminding me of Dr. Christine Sinsky, and I, she's been instrumental in my career in terms of working in the space of um, improvement and and transformation. You know, work smarter, not harder. <laughs> so what I hear from you is the opportunity to really take those tasks that, um, you know, both physicians but others who are working as a healthcare team um, aren't aren't producing value add. So thank you for that. And and Lisa, your comments actually fit nicely with a question we got in the chat box that really is about um, bringing in the patients, you know, um, and the question is, do you, do you incorporate patient preference into a, your AI models or AI models? Um, and, you know, as part of the process, are you seeing that patients or patient advocates are being consultant, uh, consulted as these programs are being rolled out? Um, so open to any of you yeah. sort of answering that question. Well, let me just Lisa? jump in quickly, this is Lisa. I would just say that, you know, in terms of the AI challenge, which is not a permanent program or model or policy, it's just an ex it's just a, a prize competition to see if we can get interesting ideas created. We are certainly, as I mentioned, in really uh, strongly encouraging teams to incorporate patient voices, patient preferences, patient co patient patient consulting, essentially, um, and for patients to be part of, of of the design of those models. So we we certainly believe that patients should be part of, of of this discussion. Yeah, and this is Anil. I, I think not only um, do I applaud CMS and AAFP for designing a challenge where patient, the patient's voice is a critical piece of it, um, but when, when these AI systems are in use, um, if there isn't any kind of feedback loop that helps us understand um, you know, what's actually happening when this is actually applied in real life um, with patients in mind, I think we will have missed, uh, missed something very big, which I, again, I, I think it's important not only to have these AI systems be able to present and it, I, and the complexity it's required to do this can only be done with AI uh, to be able to present all the different things that ought to be thought of when making a complex treatment decision with understanding the patient's motivations. Um, having that dialogue with the, with the patient and the provider and being able to visually understand the differences between side effects or um, consequences of one treatment over another. And we've certainly incorporated that into our eminence-based guideline as well as our evidence-based guidelines into our decision support tools like Watson for Oncology and, and Watson for Genomics and things of that sort. But I, I do think it's multiple stages, not only when you design the system, 
but also when you're using the system and then going back and looking at what actually happened when the system was used. So having a sort of a evidence-based AI approach to this with patient outcomes in mind and patient preference in mind, I think is going to be a critical piece. Yeah. And I would just add that, you know, a lot of the venture capital going into AI development is really focused on the digital health and really focused on the consumer, um, in addition to those focused on hospitals and providers and plans and those type of things. And then the other thing is that a lot of those engineers were part of companies that have been building for the last, you know, decades, you know, delightful consumer focused applications. So, so I think they're going to bring a, a fresh look at a lot of these issues and challenges that we have in healthcare because they bring that experience of working in the consumer space and trying to bring that uh, to healthcare because we just not have we just have not had that. Thanks to all of you. I think you're really surfacing the concept of human-centered design, and I think you know many of us are bringing that into our our work, whether it's developing a technology application or um, an intervention, you know, any aspect, because healthcare is both art and science and patients should be at the center of of the dialogue and, and should be helping to inform us in, in the work. We talked a little bit about some of the investment, the venture capital, but one of the questions that came from the audience I think speaks to one of the other elements of EHRs. Uh, not only um, has it not, it, it was built, you know, initially as more of a, a billing system and perhaps from a workflow perspective doesn't, doesn't um, provide as much uh, as a, the value we'd like to see in um, provider offices, but there's also a cost component to it as well. So one of the questions from the audience that can be impactful, especially for primary care providers. So one of the uh, questions is, you know, how, while there's promise in AI, you know, do we have a sense of how that might be an additional cost that, you know, needs to be accounted for in some way so that it truly is yeah. accessible um, within healthcare? Yeah, this is, this is Anil. I, I'll take a first stab at it. Um, you know, we as a, a as, as a technology company that's been uh, dabbling and then now very mature uh, solutions and you know AI solutions in healthcare. Um, I think what we see um, is you know it's all about ROI. It's all about value. It's it's about quality of life of the provider and the impact we can make on their patients. So. What I would say is, is that um, you know there's always going to be cost to innovation, but understanding you know what are the costs that are being removed or being lessened by the advent or the introduction of that AI solution is going to be key. And oftentimes it simply might mean that you start with some of the more uh, administrative tasks that already have cost um, to the organization um, and and sort of adopt solutions that might uh, help improve. Uh, efficiency in, in uh, areas or help re reduce errors, uh, help improve quality indicators so that uh, there's a greater likelihood of getting all the incentive dollars that are available, et cetera. So I think that's a very important discussion to have before embarking on a project. Oftentimes, what we see is that um, you know, the, the provider organizations will, will jump into a specific project um, thinking of it as a proof of concept without Full recognition of what it might mean to actually scale it at an enterprise level or scale it beyond their their one or two physicians and so it's a very good question and you know mature uh, organizations should be asking um, or rather folks should be asking mature uh, organizations and vendors you know what is the value that is being provided how do I get an ROI on this um, but having said that um, you know sometimes uh, innovation um, uh, you know, requires a leap of faith in some cases, and certainly we've gone through an entire generation of electronic health records without a clear ROI. So, um, you know, there's there's a there's a tolerance factor as well in terms of innovation. Yeah, I mean, this is Lisa. I would just I would just say as well, you know, I think uh, it's really going to be important to see ROI from some of these new things that come on board, and I think we we all hope that um, some uh, you know some adjustments around um, administrative burden will be felt and, and, and realized through investments like this in the future. However, I do think that there is, um, 
you know, there, there are lots of things that we, we don't know yet in terms of how, 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 how useful and helpful these types of predictions or assisted, assisted diagnosis or things like that will really be. And, and those can be much greater and also much harder to measure. So I think some of that is definitely going to be true. There is definitely, there are definitely some unknowns um, that could add cost in the short term. Um, I know that's not a great answer, but it definitely is realistic given um, what we know right now and what the state of uh, the data is that we use to sort of feed these tools and drive these predictions. And some of that is caused by the history of EHRs and how they were built, how they were paid for, and how they were incentivized, and the type of data that is entered into them right now for billing purposes, as you mentioned. And, you know, the, the next question, and thank you for that. I think it really, um, it, I, I think what, all of you, you know, you surface kind of the lessons learned we've all had in this space and bringing them forward, acknowledging them, but um, being creative and innovative in terms of how do, how do we learn from those lessons and apply it to the possibilities of AI. And I think it remains critical, especially because of the promise of reducing burden um, to keep that open mind um, and and work towards um, solutions. Um, another question we have, you know, we're really talking about an opportunity for AI to change the primary care workforce. And, you know, curious from all your perspectives, and Steve, maybe I'll start with um, you is, you know, I, from your perspective, how, where is the opportunity in terms of nuancing the primary care workforce to really truly maximize the power of primary care? Um, and and or and the flip side of that question is from your perspective or from the perspective of AF, AFP, how should we sort of be aligning from that? perspective so we have that in our minds as we're doing this work collectively together yeah so at least it's not a, a hard question so I appreciate that <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so you know I, I think first and foremost so I, I think um, you know family medicine and primary care um, you know has that existential question of, of what are we what is our value um, you know, so I, I think coming back to what's the core of being, you know, in a family medicine, you know, for us, it's being comprehensive, having great continuity. Um, you know, so our specialty is about 50 years old now. Um, and I think in some, the, some ways, AI allows us to get back to where we were at in the beginning of, you know, there wasn't a lot we could do, but we could really be there for our patients. And we take, we took care of everything for them. With the support of AI, there's an opportunity for us to get back to that where if I'm able to understand um, a, a cancer diagnosis and understand the, the staging and the AI is able to tell me that, you know, based on the best level of evidence that's up to date in the last, you know, day, um, this is the, the correct treatment uh, algorithm for this particular patient with this particular instance of, of this particular cancer. Um, and here's what you need to do, um, you know, in that sense, why would not a primary care doc be treating that patient with, with those? Um, if we are able to have those AI models that can able to tell you that, you know, yep, this is a, a, a normal chest x-ray, um, you know, do we need to have all this, the, those over-read uh, chest x-rays? And we can look at that too and say, okay, I'll take my clinical context and add it to that. So I think there's some things now, and that's why I mentioned that notion of the left shift is I think there's an opportunity for primary care to, to take over things that maybe some of the subspecialists have been doing. And there'll be things that we do in primary care that will be overtaken by a less skilled, uh, less trained you know, individuals all the way to the patient being able to have a lot of self-management um, if they're able to interact with a virtual bot uh, to start doing some of the the basic stuff, so I, I think we have an opportunity here to reimagine or or get back to our roots. But I think we have also this challenges of of making sure that you know from an existential standpoint, what do we want to be as as primary care physicians? 
I think what you really described is, you know, what we all hold um, as truth related to Barbara Starfield and the four C's, which have now, you know, hearing us off bitten last week, adding another C of, you know, bringing in um, patients and families and caregivers, you know, more intently into the process. Certainly that was, always was a part of it. For, so thank you for that. Um, last question um, for everyone, just, you know, a, a rapid fire question, but um, received a question from um, the CBC Plus community, Michigan specifically, just talking about, you know, there there is a lot of power with AI, and if any of you have recommendations of what I will call sort of the smart first step areas in primary care to think about how to integrate AI. I think you've alluded, um, you know, in your in your comments to some of them, but I think this is an important topic to just circle back before we end our time together. Um, so I'll just, uh, Anil, why don't you start? Sure, sure. I think the, the first step um, to any successful AI journey is, is to make sure that you're actually solving the most pressing problem. Um, there are plenty of folks out there who are um, producing solutions and scaling those and making sure that you pick the right partner. So just getting a, a good sense of who, who in your organization uh, is available to help you figure out that journey. Um, do you need to hire somebody or do, do you already have the right folks to help you pick that uh, getting an inventory of your data sets. Um, ultimately, every AI solution will need to be tuned to your practice. And starting with something like back office, um, helping with chatbots for appointment reminders or for help uh, with en engagement into your into your practice, I think is where I would start. Thank you. Steve? Yeah, I would build on that. I think you have to have the right problem to begin with that people are going to buy into because um, you're, you're going to have to do work to get this to be uh, implemented. From, from my perspective, I think the other thing is to look at some of the administrative burden tasks for two reasons. One, as I mentioned in my uh, remarks, that it, it creates some slack in the practices and the physicians to be able to think about doing more. But also the, the notion of the accuracy and trust doesn't have to be at as high as level as it does if you're looking at trying to solve clinical problems. And AI and trust is one area that um, you know is really important. So that's one of the reasons that we've really focused on administrative burden as uh, some of our first uh, innovation lab uh, pilots. Yeah, and then really quickly, I would just say, you know, I think all that is important. Starting with the problem, don't start with the shiny technology or the shiny new um, new options, I guess. Um, but I would also say, you know, anything involving AI is going to depend on the data sets that you have. And I know in primary care practices and primary care settings um, and in nearly all clinical settings, we can work on um, our data quality, our data completeness, our data liquidity. Um, and I think really investing in um, making sure the data you have is as complete as possible um, and and will format really investment for um, any uh, any any clinical setting um, and will definitely help as new AI solutions become available because they all depend on data well um, thank you thank you Thank you to today's experts, uh, Anil, Steve, and Lisa, for giving us your intriguing insights. And thanks to everyone for joining in the questions that you surfaced in the chat. You'll find some additional resources from our panelists on the remaining slides, and they'll be available for download on the PCPCC website. So um, remember to check P PCPCC's website for upcoming registration information regarding upcoming webinars. And with that, I will close our time together. Thank you so much. Thank you.